Father, we give you thanks. We give you praise, Lord, because actually this morning we do recognize that we are loved by you. And there ain't no getting around it, under it, up about it. You're there. And we thank you that we can't get around it. If we're honest, there's times we wish to escape from it because you're asking us to do things that we feel may be too much. But Lord, we recognize it's only in your love, it is only in your grace that we have any life. So I give you thanks for that this morning. Lord, as we look at your word, as we unpack it, as sometimes your word, if we're honest, makes us uncomfortable. But that's because you want the very best for us as individuals and us as your body. Help us, I pray, Lord, as we read, as we unpack, to hear you speaking to us as your church, as your children. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. We are carrying on with James. You see, it's so limited, isn't it? I'd like to just say uh, uh, thank you to those who, through this week, have actually come up to me from last week and actually made a point of saying thank you. Uh, for um, the sermon last week. Very, always good to get encouragement, especially when you know you're doing a sermon that's, let's be honest, is not warm and fuzzy. Um, but actually to find that God has spoken to you, that's great. I, so thank you very much indeed. Do keep that up. Uh, and notice that's an opening gambit for you. Should after this one, you want to come and thank me, that's fine. Uh, should you wish to punch me, listen to the sermon first, okay? So... James is the leader of the Jerusalem church, half-brother of Jesus. The letter is meant for Jewish Christians who are now living in Gentile cities due to the great persecution that broke out upon the church, as described in Acts 8. And also, a lot of this teaching um, is not fresh, it's not something new, it's something that's actually based around. If you look at Matthew's, Matthew chapter 5 and 7, you'll see a lot of the underpinning in that. And as I keep making the slight comment occasionally, uh, Jesus, uh, the brother, James, Jesus' brother actually listened to his own family. Actually listened to good advice from his own sibling. Maybe there's not a lot of us that can say that about us listening to our own siblings. Anyway, I'm deliberately going to speed somewhat through some of this. I'm not going to ask all the questions sometimes. So, okay, what did you learn last week? That's the one question. What's the one thing you learned last week? That with our tongue that we praise God with, we can't use the same tongue to um, dishonor others or say horrible things about others. Because they're made in the image of God. We're all made in the image of God. Yes, we can't praise the Lord and curse. And curse, by the way, is about bad mouthing. I used the phrase last week. I use it again, slagging off. Whatever you want to call it, don't underplay it. That's what it is. You can't praise God in one hand with your tongue and then the next minute go slating somebody else who's part of your own fellowship. Just not the done thing. Thank you. And toleration of bad mouthing is biblically foul. Actually, we're not allowed to tolerate bad mouthing. Not just tolerate it in our own lives. We're not allowed to hear another brother or sister in church bad mouth someone and just let them get away with it. You don't just let it ride and and just look at them and just walk away and think it's done and dusted. You're meant to challenge it. We saw that as well. So... We are left last week with the knowledge that bad-mouthing tongue is not just unspiritual, it's actually of the devil. There is a spirituality behind it, but it's not godly. (laughs) It's really of the devil. Um, And it's not that the devil is in control of your tongue. It is the fact that if you do bad-mouthing, if you are slating people, you're doing the work of Satan, basically. It's that simple. So James is quite hard-hitting in his letter. It is meant to be pastoral. He is meant to be trying to build the church up, but he's recognising that there's points you've just got to point it out like it is and have done with it, no matter how uncomfortable it might well be. So our tongues are a world of evil. Did you feel different about your tongue this week after a while? Did you? Yeah, that's what I thought. And the good thing is, though, we can't control it. So you get an off. So it's not my fault. I can't control my tongue. 
But we learned that you can, and we're going to look at that as we go along. Our outflow, what comes from our tongue, actually reveals our inner truth. It reveals our inner source. It reveals our own evil desires when we are bad-mouthing. And to remind you again, I want to come back to this again, and I'll come back to it later. When we talk about tongue, we are talking about every electronic communication as well. Email, Twitter, and we went through that, and you all thought I was a bit daft because I didn't know some things. Email, Twitter, Facebook, you name it, all of that lot. Face-to-face, -face, not face, whatever it was somebody said, not face-to-face -face is bad, and the stuff that's done behind the back. Just as bad. Actually, to be honest with you, stuff done behind the back is, I think, sometimes worse, because it means the person who's doing it is actually a coward. Can you see I got the passion for this in James? And I hope you did as well. I think there's nothing more destructive than bad-mouthing, gossiping. I find it... Anyway. <clears throat> and calm. <laughs> so James says, well, how are you going to make this source, this inner source, pure? How's that going to happen? And this is what the rest of this, hopefully, part of this text will help us to do that. And I hope you're with me to be encouraged, but there are some hard-hitting observations in the process. So you ready? Oh, good. That's okay. Wonderful. Right. James chapter 3, verse 13 to 18. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show it by his good life. Please remember, him, his, he, whatever, also means her, she, and all of that. It's the Greek word that actually was an all-encompassing word, meaning both genders. Fortunately, English translations normally translate it as um, masculine. But they actually would have seen it as just a, right across the board. So just to point that out. So it does mean, my sisters, you're not off. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show it by his good life, by deeds done in humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbour bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, of the devil. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure. Then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace raise a harvest of righteousness. So I want to remind you again, this is one long letter. This is not broken down. This would have been read all in one hit out loud at the churches that James was writing to. So this section is clearly connected to the previous section that we looked at last week. So this question, who is wise and understanding among you, is directed back to what we class as uh, chapter 3, verse 1. Not many of you should presume to be teachers. And we unpack teachers are teachers who... People who want to be teachers, who want to be leaders of the church, or are teachers in Sunday club, the crash, the ask. You know, people like myself standing up here as well. And it was recognised that we who are teachers are judged more harshly. That's my warm and fuzzy bit. I so look forward to that bit. But this really unpacks because I think there are times that there are people that just wish to be teachers, but maybe behind the scenes. So I would say this is directed at teachers and those who want to become teachers. Or basically, quite frankly, those people who think they know better than everybody else. Who think they can teach everybody else a thing or two. Who've got that attitude about them. And this is directed at them. And unfortunately, they exist in church. They exist out in the world. We might say, oh, my workplace, my college. They exist there, but they also exist in church. 
James is writing primarily to a Christian community. So James is opening up with this question, who is wise and understanding among you? So it's almost, this is where my imagination kicks in a little bit. It's almost like imagine James standing, if James was actually saying it out loud, and he says, if you think you're wise and understanding, please stand up. Please stand up. I don't know why, there's that song. Um... Anyway, we won't go there. Yeah, no, yeah, that one, but we won't go there. Why, if you think you're wise and understanding, please stand up. And I've just got this imagination, a room full of people, just like this one. People dotted around start standing up. Good. Now, I recognize currently, other than myself and Philip the cameraman, we're the only ones standing up, all right? But we're not answering this question. We're already stood. <laughs> so they're already hanging around. These people may be the wealthy in James's time, the mouthy. Those may be people who actually, in reality, got quite disordered lives, but they believe they're wise and understanding, and they've stood up. Those who maybe want to keep up with the Joneses, so they look good, so they stand up, because they say, clearly, I, I better stand up and say I'm wise and understanding, because look at me. I keep up with the Joneses. If you don't understand that term, that term basically means, look at me, I'm keeping up with the person next door who's got the 2.4 cars. No, 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 no. Some people treat their cars like children. You're talking to one. So, no, I knew it meant to children, but I want to go the whole 2.5 cars. It is true. Those who look like they want to keep up with the Joneses, those who want to keep up appearances, they might well be standing. So there they are, resplendent, looking gorgeous, and still stood. And they're saying to the people who are still seated, Yes, you know, clearly that I am wise and knowledgeable. This is why I'm standing, and I wish you just to nod affirmation at this. And you know I'm wise, because look at my lifestyle. I have things in my life. In the modern West, people believe wise and understanding is based on the abundance that you have. That is not what is biblical. That does not make you wise and understanding. But some people might stand up and say, well, you know, I don't get any trouble from Satan because I am so well loved by God. I would suggest you don't get trouble from Satan because you're not really doing anything for the kingdom of God. Satan ain't bothered about you. Oh, and I stand up and I speak rubbish and I tell people things that I maybe shouldn't be telling them and I'm having a go about people, but nobody tells me off, nobody stops me, nobody stomps on me, nobody challenges me about that. Clearly they know I am wise and understanding. You got the image in your head? It's this sort of unpacking. I can imagine these people thinking in, in what is here very much a nation, a uh, nation, uh, a culture that was based on honour and shame. I can imagine that sort of happening. We unfortunately also, believe it or not, can be a culture based on honour and shame. We're about appearances. So there they stand awaiting the leadership affirmation of James to say, yes, you are. And then he says, let them show it by their good life. He says it quite here. Let them show it by his good life. And at which point they're probably sitting there going, yes, my good life. Got car, got no trouble, got no problems. I, as I said, I am never stomped on. Look at me. On a Sunday morning, I look good. Come Sunday afternoon, I might like different. But Sunday morning, I look good. Yes, I look good. And then James says, deeds done in humility that comes from wisdom. We see it here in verse 13. And they say, yes, I'm humble. I'm just standing here so you, I'm a good example to you. It's deeds done in wisdom, says James. That's what makes you wise and understanding. So what's wisdom? James will now distinguish for us between heavenly wisdom and earthly wisdom, what he terms as earthly. So let's look at what earthly wisdom wisdom is verse 14 but if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts 
Do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, of the devil. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. The earthly wisdom that James is talking about, its source, remember the tongue source? Its source is bitter envy and selfish ambition, which we'll go, that's easy, we got that. There's nothing wrong with ambition. As long as the ambition is for the glory of God. Selfish ambition is selfish for one's own glory. I.e. those people standing. And this phrase here that he uses for bitter envy is better conveyed as harsh zeal, rivalry. It's not just that you, you've got a bitterness in your heart that you keep quiet and you envy something from someone. You're actually quite harshly zealous in your envy. There's real rivalry in you. You want to usurp that person. You want to take them down, remove them from their position, which they have in humility and has been appointed by God. But you want to take them down. It's that sort of term. Now, there's nothing wrong with zeal. There's nothing wrong with ambition. It's when it becomes about you. But this is where the problem is. And one of the commentators I read, David, says this. The problem is, is that zeal can easily become blind fanaticism, bitter strife, or a disguised form of rivalry and thus jealousy. The person sees himself as jealous for the truth, but God and others see the bitterness, rigidity, and personal pride which are far from the truth. Always, for me, is that reflection. It's okay being zealous for the Lord. But we look at Paul, for example. He was known as zealous for the Lord. But he was going in the wrong direction. He didn't realize. He needed a shake-up. Some people are blind to it. But God and others within a fellowship for James clearly would see that there was something wrong. Or should do. So being ambitious... Being zealous for the Lord is fine. Striving for more is okay if it's for the glory of God. You know, I sort of semi embarrass Frank about this. And I'm just picking on because he's a great example because there it is and you're all staring at it. He didn't do that for his glory. It was something he saw. I believe it was given to him by God. And he took the time out to get on with it. He would have quite happily done that without anybody saying a word. But I believe you should, we should encourage each other. Especially when I know that, you know, no, if Carol's here, I better not say, he was quite safe, Carol. <laughs> he was fine, Carol. He really was. I'm only joking. He was absolutely fine. I was there. He was fine. <laughs> No, he was great. We did look after him. I did make sure he was okay. He's all right. He's all right. The fact he's still walking, he played this morning, clearly proves he's okay. And I'll keep digging that hole and I'll stop now. So this is what James is saying. Jealous, bitter envy is just not wisdom. That's come from, uh, that has not come from God. The selfish ambition bit, I want to unpack that a little bit more in here. Um, it's, the way that it's been termed here in the Greek, we don't really pick up in the English properly. It's almost the self-seeking pursuit of a political office. Like our politicians, I'm not saying they're selfish, but you know, they, it's that sort of term, wanting a position of power for self-seeking purposes. That's the term that he's using. But the New Testament meaning also means it goes beyond political office. It terms it as you are trying to create a breakaway group from within the church. This selfish ambition, you're actually to the point where you've become your own self-appointed leader. 
though that you're not acknowledged by the main body as a self-appointed leader, and you've you sort of dragged people around you who are either slightly fairly new into the Christian walk, or maybe are just a little bit too scared of the person to challenge them. It's that sort of thing, and that this self-imposing leader, this jealous leader, who's jealous for no reason other than because I want what they've got. Not for the glory of God. I want what they've got. Which is interesting, seeing what they think a leader or anything else has got is prestige and power, when in reality they're the ones who are judged more harshly by God. It's that sort of thing. And then this group, as another commentator would put, would accuse the parent body of rejecting God's wisdom and truth. But James says their problem is that it's not external, but it's actually in your own heart. Where you think the main body of the leadership or the church have actually got it all wrong, they haven't. The problem is you. It's your own internal problem. That's a lot to say in what we just literally define as selfish ambition. In English, do you see what I mean? It's such a bigger term. And we miss that sometimes. I miss that until I'm able to do this. And he's saying your own evil desires. And you say it's the spirit of God speaking. And James is saying, no, it's not. It's you. Verse 15, this wisdom is of the devil. There's no mucking about with James. That's what I like about James. He is hard-hitting. He's direct and to the point doesn't wash around it. He says, if you've got envy and selfish ambition, it's not of God. If you know somebody who's like that, look at them. Look at their lives. Check it out. Make sure. Because I bet you they might sound good, but actually it's of the devil. They're not satanic themselves. They're not possessed by demons. But actually their influence and what they're getting from is all their own selfish ambition. I put the term here, ouch. (laughs) It's not neutral. This wisdom is not neutral. It's not just a... It's not just something that you can just be disregarded and forgot about very quickly. This wisdom actually is, this selfish ambition, this way of causing grief is actually of Satan. There is a spirituality behind it. Nothing we do my brothers and sisters, in any way, shape or form, is not unspiritual. There is a spirituality behind everything we do. It's either godly, human spirit, or demonic spirit. And the proof for for James in this is, how do you tell that somebody is using, how do you know it, it is earthly wisdom? For where you have envy and selfish ambition, verse 16, there you find disorder and every evil practice. It causes discord. If somebody has got selfish ambition, well, actually, let's take a step back. Think about your work situation just for a minute. Sometimes it's more obvious there. You always know the people who have got selfish ambition, don't you? Yeah? The ones who want to climb the corporate ladder. Because guess what they do? They'll stomp on anybody. They'll slay anyone. They'll backstab. They might have a little conversation in the uh, work kitchen. Do you know what I mean? Or at the water cooler. Or in the toilet. Or at the fag smoking shed. Yeah? Yeah? That little conversation, on that journey up in a car, two of you together on a long journey, and all of a sudden the conversation seems to be going down a route you didn't expect. And then what you see is you turn around, after a while you notice that people in the building don't like that person particularly much. Because actually whenever they climb up the ladder, there's always some damage being done to someone along the way. That's always the obvious I think for James, when he's writing to his church, it's not always so obvious. So he's saying, so what is it then? This every evil practice that they use. 
the untold damage, the family division. Unfortunately, we churches do divide. We Christian brothers all talk about love and loving each other, but we don't seem to do that very well at times. There seems to be discord. And I'm really trying to keep a lid on my emotions about that in a moment. But there seems to be real discord. There seems to be silence in omitting truth. We won't want to tell the truth totally, so we omit it. We'd rather have the quiet life and not challenge people. So the problem is when we don't challenge people, it grows, it gets worse. And James is saying here, you will see this blind fanaticism in someone in every evil practice they use. This constant banging on maybe about the same thing all the time. They use every evil practice. And this person is not of God. This person is actually doing the will of Satan unknowingly. And you can tell that, says James, by actually the disorder that they leave in their wake. The broken lives they leave, the division they leave, the upsetness they leave. You can see that envy and selfish ambition at work. In their wake, they leave a wreckage. And remember, I come back to the fact that James is making it clear that biblically this is intolerable. So we should be on the lookout for it all of the time. These are the people who leave this wreckage, are the people who are standing up saying they're wise. And I am sure, my brothers and sisters, you can think of people in your own lives who when you sit and look and you look back at what they've left behind, you can tell that it was born out of bitter envy, selfish ambition and every evil practice. That's earthly wisdom. And you can tell it by how it comes out of the tongue. Email, Twitter, Facebook, you name it. Texting. Now, it's at this point you're all going, please move on. I can quite assure you, I sat there with this week and I went, oh, I can't, but on fr- come Friday, I was sitting there thinking, Ah, this is such a cheery one. But it's truth. It's got to be told at times. And actually, some of this stuff is being told to us, so we are on the lookout for it, my brothers and sisters. And we'll come to that in a moment. So here we go for the repair, the source of our tongues. Now the heavenly wisdom. Praise God. Here we go. Wisdom that comes from from heaven. And it's those ones who are seated. Well done, every single one of you. (laughs) It's those that are seated. So let's quickly read verses 17 to 18. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace raise a harvest of righteousness. Those who claim to be wise will be known by the fact that first and foremost, their wisdom is pure. And the pure that's meant here literally is godly purity, godly holiness, godly otherness. This wisdom actually does not come from within themselves. It comes from outside. It is first and foremost, pure. It means that this person who is wise is actually solely for the Lord. Their heart is after the Lord. They're no longer double-minded. Do you remember back in chapter 1, it talks about those who are double-minded should ask for wisdom from God, but they shouldn't be double-minded about it, getting tossed about. And that double-minded was about the fact that you've got one sort of foot in the godly camp, but actually in reality you've got another foot that's in the camp of the world. You're not quite sure which camp you want to be in. 
on a daily basis, an hourly basis. All this morning, you're all really pleased that you're here. Well, you was in the worship time because you was talked about how God loves you. God still loves you, but he's a good loving father. He likes to discipline us as well, okay? Because he wants the very best for us. So this morning, you're probably going, yes, I'm in the godly camp. Some here, maybe this afternoon or tomorrow morning, especially when you go back to work, might suddenly jump into the worldly camp. Wisdom that comes from heaven is pure. It is, not, it is for those who clearly are solely trying to do their best for the Lord. They don't have selfish ambition. They're not trying to usurp everybody else. They're actually there just for the glory of God. And this wisdom comes from the Spirit. This wisdom leads people to do the right thing at the right time. Not necessarily the popular thing, by the way. It's one thing I've learned some, as a church leader sometimes. You're doing the right thing. It's not always the popular thing for a while. Until people eventually see. And that goes for all of us as Christians. In your workplace... You are sometimes doing things that actually people don't like. Hence that announcement, that, uh, that, that article that wants to be written. Sometimes some of us have done things that are the right thing, the godly thing. But actually we've suffered for it. But that's okay. Your wisdom came from God. It is pure. It is from God. It's from nowhere else. It comes from God. It comes from a relationship with God via the Holy Spirit through his son Jesus. It comes in spending time in prayer. It comes in, and not just in prayer first thing in the morning and then forget God after that. It's a constant communication with him. Do you know, it makes me laugh. I, you know, I have a mobile phone, yes, but it's personal. It's just purely between me and my family and that's it, okay? But what makes me laugh, man, are people that have spent ages texting somebody else's family to keep in contact or checking the internet or their Facebook page, but ask you to actually have a chat with God. Oh, no, 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 I've had me half an hour of prayer time. What? We see people here in the congregation on their phone. No, they're not looking at their Bible app. I can assure you. I watch it as I walk back. <laughs> not saying it's happening this morning, but I'm just saying I've observed it. And that's up to you. It's through this relationship that you get this wisdom. It's not self-generated, it's godly generated. Those who are wise in God recognise their reliance on God. They recognise that he is the source. He is the only source that can actually repair the evil tongue. These people who are wise, who are first of all pure, and then I'm going to read out the rest, who are peace-loving, they are considerate of others. They are submissive, not just to God, but believe it or not, submissive to other brothers and sisters, their needs, their wants, and submissive to the authority that God has put in place, both church and government, as long as the government's not doing anything against God. These people are full of mercy. You can tell their lives, according to this, by their good fruit, and that reminds us of Galatians, does it not? The fruits of the Spirit. By the way, fruit is born out of growth in a tree. It is not something you self-generate. It is born again out of your relationship. You get peace, joy, love and all of that because of your relationship with God. Not something that you put a front on on Sunday morning. It is also impartial. Remember, James talks about no favoritism. Wisdom that comes from God has no favorites. It is impartial in its judgment of people. It's impartial in its love of people. And most importantly, at the end, it is sincere. It's real, this wisdom. It is not learnt from a book that maybe that will sound good just at the right moment. It is not something I've picked up. I've heard somebody else and gone, oh, I'll make myself look good when I quote that. 
It's sincere. This wisdom is genuinely born out of the relationship with God. It is truly heavenly. And these people who don't need to claim to be wise, those of you who are all seated, well done. You're saying, actually, I don't need affirmation from a leader because my affirmation comes from the leader of the universe. I know that because of my relationship with him. That's wisdom that comes from heaven. And we could sit here all morning trying to unpack that that really looks like. But to be honest with you, the only way you're ever really going to know it is to live it. The only way I'm ever going to know it is to live it. So James carries on. Chapter 4, verses 1 to 10. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You want something, but don't get it. You kill and covet, but you cannot have what you want. You quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. I'm going to leave it at that. Verses 1 to 3 to me, are a clear indication that something is going wrong in the church in James's time. There are fights and quarrels. And he's saying, this is a practical issue. What happens? It's because you fight. Your quarrels end up leading to fighting. Now, you're all at that point going, oh, yeah, they mean they just shout at each other. Well, no, the term here, funnily enough, fight actually does literally mean armed conflict. And the quarrels literally means angry disputes. Not just a little, da, 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 right, forget about it, move on. Real angry, shouting, screaming, disputes. I think it's same Benedictine made me laugh, the, uh, um, who set up a ministry. One of his rulings in the monastic ways was that when a brother fight and punch each other, this is what they are meant to do. It's something along those lines. I'm, I'm ad phrasing. It's only just come to my mind. I, I use it once here at church to show the reality of life, even in the monastery. If you get this lovely, you know, sort of thing, these, not, these monks were ex-soldiers. So sometimes they dealt with things by punching each other's lights out. At least they're honest. Ah, at least they're honest. It's being done face to face. That's open honesty. Yeah? Not behind the back. Which we now think is the politer way to do it. What? Please. So anyway, let's come back to the fact that quarrels don't just happen face to face these days. They do happen by text, emails, Twitter, Facebook, yada, 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 and all that lovely stuff. There used to be a time when you used to have, to have a public fight... It was only those that immediately around you saw it, yeah? If you had a quarrel in the middle of a crowd, it's only those in the immediate would see it. And then, yeah, maybe a few others would hear about it as those people, witnesses, pulled away and spoke about it. Unfortunately, these days, in our modern technology, we seem to fight on the internet or fight by quarrelling or put a nasty comment on there about somebody or something. And then the problem is, it sits there forever. So it never gets forgotten. And that, for me, if Christians do that, they're bringing the kingdom of God into disrepute. When you text something to someone that's not particularly pleasant because you're in a foul frame of mind with them, it, just because it disappears from your phone, trust me, it's on their phone, and every time they look at it, even though you might have said afterwards, I am so sorry, but I find people tend to say sorry face to face. Or sort of half, sorry. Yeah. I don't tend to do it properly in a text or a letter. So the problem is, anybody that reads their texts, they will be reminded of that moment. If it's on Facebook, it sits there, apparently, for the whole world to see. I think for me, we need to put some of this into context. 
that our day to day, we should be careful. And you're all, probably some of you are sitting there going, but that doesn't happen, does it, Pastor Warren? It doesn't happen in this church, does it? It brings the kingdom of God into disrepute. Nothing else. Because what did, what did it say? John said, or Jesus said, you, people will know that I exist, know by your love for each other. What if the Christians here for James clearly is saying, if you're not loving each other, this is the backstory. if you're not loving each other, how are people going to know that Jesus exists? This love, this wisdom, this love that is self, that is generated, not from self, but generated from your relationship with God and your relationship with each other, that doesn't come about if you're slating everybody. If you're having a bit of a backfight because you're not happy about something and you stick it on the website. Oh, could you imagine if James was here today? Oh. Whew. Stulak, one of the other commentators, said the fighting among Christians which James is addressing is an outrageous evil, yet it is accepted complacently. It is tolerated. And we've seen already, biblically, we should not tolerate those who bring the kingdom of God into disrepute. So, my brothers and sisters, let's always be on the lookout. Not looking for every little thing, but you know what I mean? Let's keep attentive ears, attentive eyes. I'm not saying it's happening right now, but this is the point. Healthy conflicts are good for any organisation. Healthy conflicts. We need to sometimes, iron sharpens iron, it says in the Bible. Sometimes we need to do some of that sharpening in love to, to, to help move things on. And especially healthy conflicts come out when something is growing, an organisation is growing. We are growing as a church. We, this building, this new work, is, is, is physical evidence of what God wants to do. So growth is going to happen. I pray for that. Amen? I hope you do. Why? Because Not because Greenford Baptist Church will look good, but because the kingdom of glory is going to have more people in it. Yes? yes. So we're going to have probably healthy conflicts. Healthy but unfortunately, what happens is that actually what James is attacking, the fighting, which is unearthly and spiritual, is of the devil. That happens as well. And that shouldn't. And that's what we as church should pull together as family and squash it. Deal with it. Call it what it is. Don't tolerate it. Call it what it is. I believe God is going to do something marvelous in this fellowship in the years to come. And I know that Satan, he ain't going to like it very much. And he's going to want to tear it apart. I tell you, the fact that James bangs on about it so much, I believe it is one of the key Achilles heel of any relationship and any building of God's kingdom is let Satan come in and destroy the relationships. And he does it behind the scenes. And James says, for those of you who fight and quarrel and you do not get what you want because you ask with wrong motives all of the time. People sometimes don't get what they want. And it's not just about personal possession, but it's about those people who are standing up, wanting the prestige, wanting to look good, or maybe want to do something that they think God is calling them to do. The reason you don't get it, says God, says James here, is because you're asking for wrong motives. You are the people who are double-minded. And this is where James doesn't pull his punches. He says, you adulterous people. Don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred towards God? Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think scripture says without reason that the spirit he calls to live in us envies intently, intensely? But he gives us more grace. It's a little line, but you should be going, praise God. But he gives us more grace. That is why scripture says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Verse four, you adulterous people, he says. 
you who cause fights and quarrels, you are having an affair with the world. You come to church, but actually there's fight and quarrelling. So you're clearly in the world. You're having an affair with the world. She is your mistress and you're denying it. That's what the funniest thing is. You don't believe it's true. By your actions, you are hating God. You say with your mouth, Father, I love you, but you then you fight with the very people who are made in the image of God. It's the same fight your lover, the world, has always had with God's people. And there you are, right in bed, right alongside her, right now. It's a lot to be said in adulterous people, isn't it? And it goes further. This term, when you're caught between two worlds, you are adulterous. You are having an affair. Literally, the term is this, and I'm going to say it as it comes. It's stronger than that. It is saying you literally are a whore, you are a prostitute. That's what's causing the fight and quarrelling, is because you want both sides of both worlds. You're not willing, you, your selfish ambition, your bitter envy is causing you because you actually got an affair really with the world rather than loving God. You're a pride-filled, self-centered, obnoxious slapper. The reason I'm being that strong is the terms are that strong. If you don't love God, if you don't go wholeheartedly for God, and it's never a should, it's your up to you if you want to or not, but don't pretend that you're in one relationship with him here, but actually in reality you spend the other six days of the week over here wanting your own desires. And you try and make those play out in the church. God says, you're having an affair. You're betraying. You're hating me. Oh, you can come to church and say, I love you, Lord, but you're actually hating me by your actions. Verse 6, he gives us more grace. Because the Spirit envies intensely. God opposes the proud, so he opposes those who stand up and gives grace to the humble. And this is the cure. Ready? Verse 7. Submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. I know this is a miserable one, but submit yourselves to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Amen? Amen. The problem is, I hear so oft people just quoting the last bit, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. The first bit is the more important bit. Submit to God. Come near to God, verse 8, and he will come near to you. Take your wisdom from heaven. And because you're heaven, you're submitting to God, your relationship to God is more important. You can resist the devil because your focus is on the Father. And then he will flee. The devil, when will then flee from you? It's not that he, you can just resist. There's a point the devil goes, well, what do I do? Got nothing left. Does a runner. And I believe that's also to us as church, not just to individuals. Let him purify your hearts. When you submit to God, your source becomes repaired. If you're worried about what comes out of your tongue, your relationship will, with God will sort that out. Because you're no longer double-minded. And again, I come back to this. I speak to myself as I do everybody else. And then it just says, literally here, come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Said James doesn't pull his punches, does he? Grieve, mourn and wail, change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom because actually you're in a lonely state. If you think you're wise, you're not. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. You don't stand up yourself. God lifts you up. Amen? Who wants that affirmation? Who wants God to go, please stand up? Actually, don't even bother standing up. We're going to come and lift you up. I'm going to raise you up. I'm going to show you as somebody who is somebody who's after my heart wholly. 
You don't need the affirmation. You need it purely from God. You don't need it from a James. You need it from God. And you don't need to stand up because God sees what's going on. Your relationship with him will tell you. You won't care what anybody else thinks because you know your father, your heavenly daddy knows you. That's the cure for the bad tongue. That's the cure for a tongue that you can't control yourself. It's your relationship with God. And do you know what? He wants the relationship. It's not something you've got to beg for. He didn't send his son Jesus to die so that you couldn't have the relationship. That was the whole point. I just get excited when you realise that actually just in those glimpses of pastoral James not pulling his punches, lashing it out and telling it like it is, he's also telling it like it is about the grace of God. He's telling it like it is. Listen, your cure is this. Submit to God. There's fighting and quarrelling among you. It's your own selfish ambition. If you really want to turn that around, submit to God. Let him take over. Let him have the driving seat. Let him into your life. Let him tell you what he thinks of you and how brilliant you are. then you won't crave selfish ambition. You won't have bitter envy because anything anybody else has got right now that you want on this planet, believe you me, is fleeting. It doesn't last very long. As you know, it was my birthday on Tuesday. I realise I'm one year closer. I ain't got many years left. (laughs) Hang on, hang on. Do you know what? And that's okay. Because where am I going? To meet the Father Father for eternity. And that's true for all of us. So why would you desire things now, cravingly, bitterly, selfishly, now? It's a waste of time. Submit to God. Let your relationship with him be your primary importance. Verses 11 to 12, very quickly, because it's a summary. Brothers, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against his brother or sister judges them, speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you are not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. There is one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? James has given us the cure He just returns to summarize in a very blunt manner. Stop judging. Stop slandering. Your tongue is poison. Submit to God. When he talks about the law, it's that law that we talked about earlier on in chapter 2, which is talking about love thy neighbor, the royal law. Who wants to actually have that relationship with God to the point that all your bitter envy your selfish ambition is gone we all have glimpses of it somewhere I you may not be you might be the most humblest wonderfully put great come and tell us how you do carry on developing that relationship what I'm saying is all of us at some point we'll see something that somebody else has got and go oh, yeah and then get upset when we don't seem to be getting it it's because we ask for wrong motives. Or we'll start seeing things around in about our own fellowship. I'm going to be up front because as we're growing, we've got to keep an eye out. If you want to submit to God, if you want your tongue to actually produce fruit rather than rotten apples, now is the time. Let us pray. Take a few moments with yourself with God. Literally come near to him, knowing from this morning that the table is well and truly open. (coughs) 
Proverbs 3.34 says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Lord, I do want to pray for each and every one of us. Lord, that we become people. We become people who daily, minute by minute, second by second, our hearts and our focus is for your glory. We worry about what you want. Father, I pray for each of us in our relationships, in our dealings with not just people in church, but actually people outside in the world, that, Lord, we are people whose tongues speak your fruit. Our inner source is heavenly. Pray that, Father, knowing full well of that we stand and sit in your grace, your love, all of the time. In the name of Jesus, amen. We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.